for joining me. I'm so excited. Today we get to speak with um, Daniel Maycock. Daniel is the founder of Polymath Classical Tutorials, um, www.polymathclassical.com, and um, where he, he teaches classical mathematics there. And he also offers summer workshops in writing and mathematics. Daniel also teaches composition, literature, material logic at Memoria Press, um, their online academy. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Memoria Press. He is a homeschool graduate. Daniel also has a BA in English and music from the. Can you pronounce that for me? How do you pronounce that? Called? Sure. Lagrange. It's uh, Lagrange. Mm -hmm. Lagrange. Okay. Lagrange College and a master's in liberal arts from St. John's College in Annapolis. And uh, Daniel in, and his wife Haley live in South Carolina. Uh, welcome, Daniel. Thank you so much for joining us. Sure. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. This yeah. is the, the, this is, is really exciting. Wonderful. Well, we're glad you could make it. And um, I don't know if any of you have um, heard of St. John's, but St. John's is a, an amazing liberal arts college. They have a campus in Annapolis and then in New Mexico, right? Yes. Correct. Mm -hmm. And they, when you think about the liberal arts, a liberal arts college, St. John's is like the epitome of it. You know, anyone who loves the tradition would love to go there. Um, it, I'm getting that right, am I not? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Sure. Uh, well, what was your experience like there? I know that's not really exactly why we're here today, but I think a lot of people <laughs> like to know about it. Sure. Uh, well, because I mastered there rather than doing my undergraduate. Um, in some sense, I didn't get the full experience because uh, I was only there for four semesters as opposed to four years. Um, but it was fantastic. It's, it was a very, very uh, big change from learning in a more lecture format, which is what most of us are, are used to in college. Because you do the reading material at home, or uh, I guess in your dorm if you're like an undergrad student. Uh, and then you get together with all your classmates and a tutor and just talk about it. Um, and our meetings were frequently like two hours. We'd sit down for two hours and talk about the Iliad, for instance, um, which was tremendous. That's, that's wonderful. That's very cool. I think that's what a lot of the people who will be watching this are kind of, that's the spirit in which they like to, to approach education as well. And um, well, Daniel is here today because, as you know, we've been in a series about the liberal arts. Uh, we just finished the posts um, about the trivium, the, the language arts part of the liberal arts, and now we're about to start looking into the quadrivium a little more and, and taking a dive in there, asking questions about what the ancients meant and the medieval uh, scholars meant when they would say what they were saying about the, the quadrivium. Uh, what are its virtues? What are its fruits? What does it do for us? How do we approach it classically? These are a lot of the questions we're going to be talking about today. Uh, one of the reasons I, I asked Daniel to come on here is mostly I feel a little ill-equipped to talk about the quadrivium. The, the art, the mathematical arts are an area where the Lord's still redeeming a lot of that in my life. Um, I'm still learning so much. I'm so at the beginning. And so um, I thought it wise to to have a conversation with somebody who's kind of been before us a little bit, taken a few um, few more steps than we have, and I'm sure he thinks I'm playing this up, but he doesn't realize how little math experience I have. So, um, so we're we're just here to have a conversation, really, and um, and talk through some questions, and um, and yeah. So we're glad that we can do the, um, do this, and thank you so much for being here, and. Um, did um and so did you want do you want me to just go ahead in with my questions or did we want to just do you want to ask your questions first or um because I'm uh, flexible. Sure, I, I I suppose we could start with, with some of your questions. Although I, I feel like I really <laughs> ought to say that um you talk <laughs> you talk about me as one who's gone before and. I mean, there are people who have gone before me. Obviously, I mean, there are people. I I I I I feel like. What I'm doing is uh, just uh, just be a student. I'm just being a student, um, and 
I don't know. I, I suppose I, 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 it, just to be honest, it's kind of intimidating, I think, to be put in the position of uh, like this, where you're expecting, I don't know, some kind of wisdom. So I'll do the best that I can. But uh, <laughs> uh, we are, as you've said, I guess, really still at the, uh, at the brink here. Mm -hmm. Well, I really appreciate that. And I think any of us who are entering into this tradition would say the exact same thing. Um, because we're, the more we recover, the more we learn about it, the more we realize we still have so much more to learn. And so um, I think we, we would all say that. So I appreciate that. So we're just two students inquiring into the nature of the mathematical arts today. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. Okay, awesome. Okay, so the first question I had um, was about, as been with the liberal arts tradition, they talk about how the mathematical studies were divided into two main divisions, discrete and continuous mathematics. Um, he, and they would say, and they said arithmetic is the discrete mathematics, and then harmonics are discrete mathematics in time. And then geometry was categorized as continuous mathematics, and astronomy was continuous mathematics in time and space. How would you, um, and I know I need this, and probably a lot of other listeners might need this, how would you explain or talk about the difference between discrete and continuous mathematics? Well, <laughs> that's a, uh, a challenging question. Um, because it, it isn't really something that uh, I've had a tremendous amount of time uh, to study on my own. Uh, a lot of these things that, 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 that I'm teaching are things which I'm just reading on my own for maybe the, the first or, or even second time. Uh, but I, I guess one way to approach an answer would be to go back to, um, to Nicomachus, uh, Nicomachus's book, uh, Arithmetic. Um, where he does discuss the difference between between these, and this is, I think, where 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 uh, uh, where Clark and Jane are are are, are getting these uh, mm -hmm. things from. Because in the beginning of his book, he does say that arithmetic is um, essentially a study of quantity. And earlier on, well, he 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 sets up this discussion first by saying that all of philosophy is about uh, two things. It's about magnitude and multitude. Understanding magnitude versus multitude. And he gives some examples and he says, you know, some things are magnitudes like people, horses, uh, <laughs> which is sort of strange to think of a person as being a magnitude. Uh, but then he says some things are multitudes like flocks. Because a flock is a multitude because it's made up of a lot of mm -hmm. smaller things. Um, and so he says that, and then he goes on to, from talk, to talk about, well, from multitude and magnitude, and he says that both of these are potentially infinite. Uh, so you can't really have a philosophy about something which is essentially infinite. So we abstract from both of these categories um, quantity and size. So quantity we get from multitude. Uh, size we get from magnitude. And then from quantity and size, we get uh, arithmetic, um, harmonics, or music, and then geometry and astronomy. And so um, the ones dealing with quantity are uh, arithmetic and harmonics. Both go together as dealing with quantity. And then the ones dealing with size, of course, are geometry and, um, and astronomy. And so, uh, I don't know how much more of an, of an answer I, 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 I can give beyond that just to say what he says, because he doesn't really go into any further detail, but one thing he has in mind, by dividing mathematics in these, in, along this line, is that um, one, obviously, word we should say, I think, um, it's discrete mathematics uh, deals with quantity. So it's quantitative. Um, the end, yeah, I mean, it, it obviously deals with numbers, things that can be broken down into, in, into tiny bits. 
uh, things that can be divided, whereas continuous mathematics, at least as far as my understanding goes, can't be treated quite that way. Um, for instance, a geometry proposition can't really be broken down the way that a number can be divided. Um, you can divide, you know, 64, you can keep dividing the number 64 and half and half and half and half and half again until you get to the number one, but you can't do any such thing with the geometry proposition. And in some sense, the geometry proposition, I think, has to be almost taken as a complete whole for it to work. You know, mm -hmm. If you take out one piece, it sort of falls apart. That might be what they have in mind. Um, mm -hmm. But again, I... I <laughs> Beyond that, I, I don't really have have, uh, have much else idea. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and um, I, okay, so that helps a little bit. We have um, the discrete, and then we have the continuous. And I remember seeing one of the examples, and I can't remember. I think I was just searching online, just trying to understand the differences between them. Um, and I came upon one site, and the example they gave was the slope of a line, and in one graph it was it was, uh, and they used the example um, if you asked um, how many flowers are on this table, versus um, what what is the the height range that the average twelve year old could be, or something like that. There there's like a range of possibilities versus a particular number of flowers, or and so it was this particular thing versus this range thing. Um, and so I remember hearing that, and, and I just, the thing that was intriguing to me, and this is what I'm finding with all of the liberal arts, which kind of points to part of our purpose for our discussion, is they thought about everything so differently. And so I want to, I don't, I want to make sure that I'm willing to be open to, okay, how, what, how do they view this? How do they view mathematics? Like, what, what did it mean to them? And, um, for example, and, and maybe it's good to summarize a little bit, kind of what we've discovered with the, the, the language arts is that, um, and how the ancients really viewed all the liberal arts as seven different ways that knowledge could be justified. And so each of the language arts having their own way that they can justify knowledge and so my, my question going into this and, um, and and what I hope to discover through my research is, so uh, what is the thing that, or how how does arithmetic help me justify knowledge? How geometry, how can I justify a piece of knowledge through geometry, through harmonics, through, through astronomy, um, and therefore be more free? And so, and, and so in asking these questions, how can this, inform my discovery of that. And I know none of us are going to get all these answers in, you know, 30 minutes or one hour, but um, I think it's good to set the goal before us so we know what we're, we're reaching for and trying to achieve and that sort of thing. Yeah, he, 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 here's a question that, that uh, something you said raises, uh, or I, a question that I just thought of. Um, now, when you, when you talk about um, justifying knowledge, the several liberal arts being something that rec that uh, we use to justify knowledge. Can you maybe explain what what that would mean for 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 mathematics? Maybe that's that's a super broad question. I don't know. I I I guess my my, my question is simply what what do you mean by by justifying knowledge? I think that's a better question. Okay. Um. So maybe an example, because I've used a couple different ways. Um. And, I think it was in the Clark and Yon book where I read the term justify. It was, I think it was in their introduction to the liberal arts in the very beginning of the book where they used the term and they said to the ancients the liberal arts were the seven ways that knowledge could be justified. And so when I first started looking at that I started, I just googled. I didn't know where else to look because I hadn't really heard that term used in that way before. And so I got a lot of math stuff actually um, that came up first. Uh, when you're asked to justify your answer, I, I th um, don't you have to, and I haven't taken a, um, a, your geometry course, which I'm excited about um, auditing it this summer, um, the, um, don't you have, you have to justify your math problem. You have to um, justify your answer for getting it by mm -hmm. going s through some particular process. Correct? Yeah, yeah, that's... 
That's right. Mm -hmm. with the math arts, but with the language arts, grammar, the liberal art of grammar, um, I believe that you, when I say justify, meaning proving that it's right or um, being able to say with some level of certainty, even if it's precise certainty or probable certainty, I mean, um, or probability or certainty or um, exactness, those vary in degree. Um, for grammar, I think it is that it's the way that we justify matters of conscience, and we do that predominantly through myth. So for grammar, I think the way I can justify reality, specifically matters of conscience, is the, that liberal art of grammar. For logic, um, we're justifying knowledge. We're saying we can say something is true through reason. So justifying knowledge through reason. I can um, have a syllogism and lay out a syllogism and if I do it correctly and follow the rules, well, then I can justify that that um, conclusion by my propositions and their relationship. Uh, and, and rhetoric, and I think this is my favorite one, I'm justifying knowledge through persuasion. By the very act of the rhetorical process, I'm justifying knowledge, both just by experiencing the act of going through that process um, and in community and doing that with each other. Um, we, we justify knowledge. If we can persuade somebody, it is a way that we could say knowledge, I can justify this knowledge is right because I'm able to persuade you um, with, with the governance of a certain form, I think, to add. But, um, so with math, there, and, I, and, I don't, and I don't really know the answer to your question, um, what I do know is that each of the mathematical arts do justify knowledge in some way precisely how to name that I'm I'm not entirely sure I know what they call arithmetic which is you know the, this discrete these simple numbers these quantities and so maybe there's certain kinds of knowledge that I can justify through just knowing that it is and how many there are of it um, I, I have no you know I'm just beginning to think about it so I, I don't really know the answer to that but it would sure. be something along those lines um, something that would be a continuation of how the language justifies knowledge. So that's kind of where I'm at with it. Yeah, thanks. Um, that that I, I guess sort of leads into one other question I had for you, which is about, uh, I guess, the, the overall position of mathematics within education. Um, because we 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 can summarize the goal of, uh, of of Christian education, specifically Christian classical education, as being the cultivation of wisdom and virtue in a student. Um, and it's easy to see how some of those so some 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 pursuits would be would would more obviously lend themselves to the end something like philosophy, for instance, maybe even the study of history. Uh, but how about how do you see the mathematical arts fitting in? Do you have any, any thoughts on that? Well, my first thought is that because Plato told me to, I don't know. <laughs> um, there, I mean, beyond my own reasoning about it, the tradition includes them. And so I, I've chosen to have faith in this tradition um, because it reflects something that is true and rare. And while I'm still exploring that, part of, of being able to use this tradition without knowing everything is just having to have faith about some things. Um, saying, I'm, I'm going to embrace this because it's part of the tradition. Um, as I've been reading Clark and, and Jan's book more, um, and I've, I've been looking at some other things, it's start, I'm starting to sense that the mathematical arts have just this really amazing way of embodying, maybe not embody, maybe embodying, but illustrating the good, the true, and, and the beautiful in a way that the language arts don't. It's almost, and, and, I, and I bet if I got into advanced physics one day, I would see this even more, <laughs> but there's something about them that just, are magical, and uh, I'm just starting to to see it a little bit, 
but just good, true, and beautiful, like in your face as much as it could be in our face on this side of eternity um, through the mathematical arts, which is crazy because I grew up thinking math was stupid and pointless unless I was going to be an engineer. And I mean, other than adding so I could work at Harris Teeter, you know, I didn't think it was, there was any purpose to it. So something that is so loathed by so many people to be like the most profound thing to see the good and the true and the beautiful is just really exciting, and I get kind of hyper about it. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, no, th th thanks. Uh, you know, uh, if, if I could sort of ta ta tack something onto that, it reminds me of, and I think this is also where, where you were going when you said that, because Plato tells us so. Um, but uh, just thinking back to the way that, that Nicomachus begins his arithmetic, because he actually also quotes Plato. He actually misquotes Plato to make it more convenient for his project um, in defending mathematics. But... Uh, but he says essentially that um, that mathematics uh, is almost a, it's essentially a, a, a precursor for doing philosophy, which I just find fascinating. Um, and this is maybe a little bit different focus from where you were going, talking about the good, the true, and the beautiful. But uh, but one thing I find really interesting is just how the process of mathematics and the discipline involved. Um, and the kinds of questions it raises, I mean, we, we end up seeing echoes of these things in the great philosophers. Uh, even have Descartes, for instance, who bases his entire philosophy on a geometric process, uh, mm. where his, um, to boil down all of philosophy to maybe a single axiom from which he can recreate philosophy, almost like, uh, you know, Euclid does with, with his elements begins with as few with as few pieces as possible and creates this world of geometry. Um, so I, I think that that's fascinating. Uh, but that's I guess maybe the other side of 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 the coin because they're they're still talking about something which is practical in app in an application towards something else other than being useful in its own in in its or being valuable in 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 its own in right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I thought I think that's interesting too because I remember reading in more place than one. I know I know what it was because I've I've read Clark and Jan's book, but then I also read a book recently called Awakening Wonder. That's also published by the same people who published um, uh, the liberal arts tradition, classical academic press. And uh, so Awakening Wonder is about the good, the true, and the beautiful, and he kind of does a historical survey of it, uh, and he really calls particular attention to that age-old philosophical tension of the one and the many, and um, and that was that was the other piece. Oh, and he also said that Plato and several others kind of thought badly of those who only practiced mathematics for its utilitarian purpose. Like, well, of course you're going to learn how to add so you can sell stuff in the marketplace. That's a given. But this is why we really do math. <laughs> you know, it was it felt like that when I was reading about it. Um, but I, that, that was the other part of um, your, I think, an answer to your question that I have wrestled with some is part, I mean, this whole tradition is about wrestling through the tensions to find the harmony. And as Christians, we know that harmony is Christ. But mathematics has a really cool way, and, I'm, and I am starting to see this, of displaying the one and the many and showing how, and showing the harmony. Like, you can see that worked out in these mathematical processes. And the one and the many, the tension between them, that's like foundational to everything we're doing in this tradition. And so I don't think we can have this tradition without math if, if we think about it through that way. I mean, to see that, that tension played out in a real way in front of our eyes, I mean, the benefits of that are just countless. I mean, just countless. Just from encouragement to see it happen and harmonize. Um, I mean, it's a hard tension to, to wrestle through some of those things. So what do you think? Yeah, it's it is it is a a big uh, a big question, I guess, of how to reconcile the one and the many. Um, uh, I I even r remember seeing when I was at, at St. John's some 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 students, some undergraduate students, did um <laughs> did this a uh, parody video where they got together with their tutor and they were going to be and usually they're discussing you know like works of philosophy, but they're all sitting around this table 
And reading uh, One Fish, Two Fish by Dr. Seuss, <laughs> You know, they read a line, one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, and the, and, the, and the tutor puts the book down and says, you know, very seriously, one fish. You know, and he pauses and he thinks, says, you know, this really takes me all the way back to, Pl to Plotinus with the question of the one and the many. And, <laughs> and I guess it's just this idea that these things appear everywhere. Um, yeah. And there, obviously, it was, it was for comedic effect. Uh, reading Dr. Seuss as if it's a great book, uh, but it's still an interesting question. Uh, you know, what does it mean to have one of something? Um, yeah. And the Greeks didn't actually see one as a number, which is hmm. what I think a lot of people find interesting. They didn't have zero as a as a number concept either, but they also didn't didn't think of one as a number. Um, and so one of the things um, my students have had to get used to, and I've had to get used to is when we're reading through Nicomachus' arithmetic or reading Euclid, um, he never says one. Um, mm. He might, and I guess the uh, translators, to make sure that we know what's going on, might substitute you know, one here, you know, one line or whatever. But whenever he's talking about the concept one, as we think about it, he always refers to unity. Uh, I, I should say bo both writers always refer to unity. Um, and oh, so, wow. Um, so Nicomachus will say things like, you know, beginning this number series from unity, uh, and there he simply means the number one. So we double unity, we get diversity, um, or mm. duality, plurality. And so number for the Greeks really begins with two, uh, because that's that point at which you have something which is not unified, mm. um, or isn't a unity in itself. Um, but it is interesting. Uh, well, one of the things I, I came to appreciate this year, which I had never appreciated before um, through reading Nicomachus' Arithmetic, is the beauty of prime numbers. Hmm. And I also see this in, in, uh, in Euclid as well. But um, both, of these, both of these mathematicians look at prime numbers. And in prime numbers, I think we see something like... Um, uh, or maybe echoes of the same kind of tension because just like one, we begin from unity uh, and then we can count up and we get many other numbers. And at the same time, we recognize that each number in itself has a particular kind of personality um, because of the way that they can or can't be divided because of the properties that they have. But prime numbers um, I find particularly fascinating because a prime number is is called prime for a reason. It's the prime number because it's analogous to one. Um, just like unity begins a number series, you can begin over again using prime numbers. Um, and so even though a prime number has a number of units inside of it, a prime number in itself is almost a new starting point. Wow. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but it's almost like the, I, sorry? Well, the only way that I can conceptualize what you just said is the idea of his mercies are new every morning. Hmm. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's that that that's an interesting thought. I, I hadn't gone gone in in that direction. Um, I'll, I'll have to think more more about that. Uh, to illustrate. Um, how this works with, with prime numbers, you can think about a ruler. And we have a ruler, say, of, you know, inches. So we have um, maybe, well, let's, we'll, we'll, we'll just make it a yardstick because we've got 36 inches on this yardstick. Um, but each inch is a unit. And what if the inch was subdivided into seven units? Um, well, the yardstick would still be the same length, and we would still begin with one inch, but, the, it, but it might be made up of seven pieces. Um, and so mm -hmm. we can think of prime numbers in that same way because there's no other way to divide them, really. Yeah. Um, and so it's really almost like the numbers just start over again. And so now if you begin, you can even imagine a number sequence started on like the number seven. Um, so we'd go 7, 14, 21, and 21 would correspond to the number 3 in the ordinary number sequence. 
um, and you can just and you could really almost come up with an entire parallel um, number sequence simply based on the number seven. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know if that makes sense, but it's just really strange feature of prime numbers, where they're made up of pieces, but the pieces can't be divided, um, except into seven parts, where you, you and you get the number back again. Um, okay, okay. So some a lot of what you said, I don't, I don't really <laughs> total, I, I don't really comprehend, <laughs> but I, I think it. The last statement you made about that they can't be divided helped me realize why they are analogous to one, why they're analogous to unity, because the nature of unity is that it can't be divided. It is one. It is together. And, yeah. and in that way, I the, the power of unity, the essence of unity, the comfort in this, just, I, I guess the constancy of unity, this idea that it cannot divide it. And so I, I, get, I get that. I see that in your description, and I hadn't seen that before. And so thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> sure. And so I guess um, maybe to clarify what I said, you know, when I talk about Unicap 7, 14, 21 corresponds to 3, because you really have three sevens. Okay. Um, and so really, you're counting, still counting the three, but the number at the end looks different because we're thinking of it in terms of units. OK, um, OK, OK. I but, can see uh, that. Thinking but, it, okay. but that just seems to me to be like one of those really bizarre cases where we see this tension really highlighted. Uh, because in one sense, they're unified, but in another sense, they're not, because they're made up of a whole bunch of little uh, individual pieces. Right. Um, which are themselves units. <laughs> right. So we have in that case almost like a unity made up of little tiny individual unities, which is very, very strange. I think it's an awakening wonder where he was talking about this. And he said, uh, and so he was kind of giving the history of, um, I guess, our discussion of this, the unity and diversity. And one of the points he brought up was the Trinity. and and uh, the medieval scholars work on on what the Trinity brought to the, uh, the discussion about unity and diversity, the one and the many. Yeah. And so I thought that was interesting. But um, I know that's a theology, and I don't want to go there. <laughs> Eclipse. That is. Uh, okay. Have, is there anything else that we wanted to say about unity or ready for another question? Sure, yeah, let's let let's keep going. Okay, okay so um you mentioned your classes and um and and you have some interesting math classes. They're kind of different than we would maybe encounter in a typical classroom. Tell us more about your math classes and what makes them unique. Um and just a little bit more about what you're doing. Sure. Um, well, my my I guess the the first obvious difference between my classes and other math classes is that we don't use textbooks. Uh, well, I guess that's not entirely true. We use textbooks, but the textbooks are the original texts. So we haven't let some editor do the work for us in that sense. Okay. Um, okay. And so the class that I just finished teaching, the year-long course, uh, involved mostly, it was mostly Euclid's elements with a little bit of Nicomachus. Um, and those were our texts for the year. Uh, so we spent, um, spent our time working our way through propositions uh, in Euclid. And the benefit of doing it this way is that we get the whole picture. Uh, because Euclid is extremely systematic. And he essentially, and I, 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 I like to compare what Euclid does and his elements, um, especially in book one, to Genesis one. Mm. Because just like God creates the world out of nothing uh, in six days, we find Euclid, and this might be a little bit of a stretch, so you have to bear with me, but we find Euclid <laughs> uh, creating a world of geometry um, 
out of a handful of definitions, common notions, and postulates. Uh, mm. and from these pieces he lays out on the table, he then builds this entire system of geometry. Um, and so I think that there's a great deal of value in approaching it this way rather than having the, the principles spoon fed to us in uh, you know, bits and pieces the way that textbooks generally tend to. Um, of course, th there's, there's a reason why, why textbooks do that. It's because most of our time isn't spent on the highlights when we do <laughs> Euclid this way. Uh, for instance, it takes us 47 propositions to get to the Pythagorean theorem. Okay. Whereas, because it's such a useful thing, you can learn it, you know, in one lesson. So rather than spending mm -hmm. 47 lessons to get there, um, most textbooks will just give it to you straight. Uh, but okay. what we lose is the force of it, because really, uh, if you read it, you know, in this sequence, you find that there's really almost something like a story in the text, in the sense that we have, you know, point, counterpoint. Um, and I like to think of Proposition 47 in Book 1. There are only 48 propositions. So the very second to last proposition is the Pythagorean theorem. This is the climax of the entire book just as we would have mm -hmm. in you know, a story or a mystery novel. I mean, this is the big reveal, essentially. Um, and you've been mm -hmm. working so hard to get there, you see it in a completely different light. Um, and it's no wow. longer just this you know, basic formula which has been told to you. <laughs> but it's mm -hmm. something which you have worked through 46 propositions in order to prove. Wow. And so, wow. Um, and so, I, I, I think, I think it fosters a greater appreciation for these things. Um, mm -hmm. You also just tend to, you, you come to um, uh, understand them. I think uh, in in a completely different way. Um, so, so that's my 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 basic approach. Uh, I like to take a more conversational approach as well. So. Um, rather than lecturing, what I prefer to do is I have my students, especially in book one because it's so foundational, have them do the reading ahead of time and then they come to class and I just choose somebody and say, okay, close your book and now present the proposition to the class, uh, which can be intimidating because they they obviously get stuck. You know, I don't remember what the next step right. is. Uh, but I think that that's, um, that, you know, forcing them to work through it again themselves um, can be a very, um, it's just a really valuable activity because we're essentially thinking Euclid's thoughts after him. Um, and wow. uh, yeah. I mean, obviously, I, I think that reminds us that we're also supposed to be thinking God's thoughts after him. And so in one sense, we're following Euclid, who is following um I guess the, you know this 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 path of of rationality and logic that God has laid in our minds, um, mm -hmm. which is just a, a, a just a, a a beautiful thing, I think. Yeah, wow. That is that is beautiful, and I I think sets a great vision before us about what math can look like. Um, for, I think a lot of people. Start to feel more comfortable with the language arts in the in the trivia, and so they're, they're kind of grabbing. Okay, this is how I teach that. I, I can start feeling this, um, but when it comes to math and the sciences, which is a whole another discussion, um, we're like, okay, so how do I actually teach this classically? And so, and I know that's being recovered for all of us, um, but it's it's nice to hear. Uh, you're doing, and I, I mean, when I first thought of, oh, approaching Euclid's triad, I just didn't think that was possible. I mean, nobody, you know, who would I go to, or, you know, how would I open that up? Do I have the right to open that up? You know, like, all of that. And so, um, you know, it's just intimidating, um, especially for somebody who, um, I mean, my, my math education was not a, not a great one. Um, 
I there's there's a lot to redeem, and I'm working hard at it. Uh, it just takes time. So, so what what suggestions or advice do you give on um, homeschooling moms um, who are want to begin taking steps towards teaching math this way? Um, maybe somebody who doesn't have a good background um, who feels nervous about that or even someone who does but wants to steer more to a normative way kind of how you described of doing math but what, what advice do you have yeah uh, well I fortunately I think it's all good news um, okay. the, the first piece of good news is that there's not I haven't found that there's really a difference between or very much of a difference between teaching math and teaching literature uh, okay. Because you can approach them essentially the, the same way. The only thing that changes are what the individual questions you're asking are. In a story, you might ask questions about the plot, the character's motivation, um, uh, you know, style, author's intent, all these kinds of things. Uh, when we come to math, we ask similar questions. Um, obviously, depending on... One, I'm going to interrupt you for a second. Do you hear that lawnmower in the ground? I don't hear. Can you hear more? One second. A really loud lawnmower started, so I'm changing oh, okay. rooms. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We'll just finish here. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Sure. Okay. Please. Um, okay. So, uh, oh, so just saying that the that the that the kinds of questions uh, we ask when approaching a math text are very very similar, but we're still still just asking basic questions. Um, so when we approach geometry, for instance, you know the questions you want you want you would want to ask are well, why is this step necessary? Um, and I find myself doing this all the time. I'll read through a proposition and I'll think, well, this seems really redundant. Why? You know, what's the point of this? Mm. Or um, we'll even run into, whole, run into propositions which might seem self-evident. And we go, why does he even bother to prove this? I mean, it should be obvious, shouldn't it? And these questions can lead to very interesting discussions um, on the nature of you know, the sufficiency of proof, on the kinds of proof which are necessary, on you know what does it mean for something to be self-evident, uh, yeah. and so yeah. I don't think that it has to be foreign um, because a lot of the the ways that we approach literature I think is, is is really similar. We just ask questions of the text, questions of the author, um, and from that and trying to answer and wrestle with those questions I, I think is how we end up gaining uh, valuable insights. Mm -hmm. The the other piece of good news is that I think. Uh, it's probably a, uh, an advantage not to have had experience or an, a very large experience with mathematics um, before. Uh, and I say this because my experience um, <laughs> has been that of, of just being a student uh, the mm. entire time. Uh, because my 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 math background um, stopped. Well, I'll just say this: uh, the last math class I, I I had was my freshman year of college. Okay. Uh, and then I went to St. John's, and we did I uh, did the math and science segment there, which suddenly opened my eyes, and I thought, my goodness, math is actually a beautiful thing. Um, wow. But I, so everything I'm doing, I'm, I'm, I'm doing not as a mathematician, but I'm doing as someone who's been trained in literature, essentially. Uh, wow. That is really encouraging for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so I, I, I don't think it has to be difficult. Um, and I think that the experience you would have or any homeschool parent would have of struggling with the text, wrestling with it, trying to figure out how on earth do I teach this, uh, you're essentially, well, teaching yourself first off. And the struggles which you experience teaching yourself uh, will make you more attuned to the struggles that, that your students would have. Because I think we've all suffered from, from teachers uh, 
who have really understood things that we find foreign. Mm -hmm. And because it seems to them self-evident, oh, well, obviously this is the case, or obviously this is the thing to do. And the rest of us are going, what on earth is he talking about? Well, it seems that way to him because he's so familiar with it. Um, but the benefit we have as being people who are trying to rediscover this is that we don't have that familiarity. And so we see things, I think, or at least it's easier to see things with the same mm -hmm. eyes that the students see things, uh, which I, I think, mm -hmm. I hope, makes yeah. us better teachers in the end. Um, because yeah. we'll be more attuned to the fact that, oh, this really is a challenging proposition, and this is why. Or, yeah, this is a weird idea. I have no idea where this is coming from, uh, which mm -hmm. can be helpful because then, um, I guess I guess mostly it just tells us where our deficiencies are and where to look, uh, yeah. which is a, which is a a good thing to know not only as a student but also as a a a, a teacher, um, and then also too I think that uh, as we know so well in in the classical tradition that uh, it's it, it's powerful as teachers to be modeling what it means to be a, a good student. Um, and so there have been plenty of times in class right. when we're faced with a proposition and I get just as confused as my students do, <laughs> which I don't know mm -hmm. if that comforts them or not. Yeah. Uh, but um, <laughs> but, in, <laughs> but in, in, in some of those occasions, we, we've we've at least managed yeah. between putting all of our brains together to finally come to a solution and realize, oh, here's the answer. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think those experiences are very valuable because they're learning not only it's okay to, to be confused, it's okay that this is difficult, it's okay to struggle, uh, but they're also learning assuming that you actually come to solutions yeah. <laughs> uh, while you're working <laughs> through this, that, uh, that this is the way you go about figuring things out. This is how you approach problems. This is how, um, this is how you back up, you know, backpedal to something that you know and then try again to go forward. Um, so I guess just to summarize everything I've said, I. I think that uh, it sounds it sounds difficult. It is difficult, but I think that uh, that 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 the good news is that it's it shouldn't it shouldn't be intimidating. Um, okay. E even, yeah. even though it is work, but it's but the work I think is 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 profitable, and 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 and, and, and very doable. And failure is not is not uh, necessarily a a setback as well. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the things I, I, I try to tell my students over and over again is that you know, if, if you don't understand something uh, and you get yourself terribly, terribly confused, well, this is a point at which real learning can now begin. <laughs> because now Man. you know that you don't know something. And Amen. <laughs> we now have to find some creative way uh, to come to a solution. And I think also, sort of as another rabbit trail, I think that it's in getting confused and having to work our way out of the confusion without having an answer key ready at hand, mm -hmm. which also helps teach the fact that mathematics is a creative pursuit. Mm -hmm. um, because oftentimes we discover the answers uh, or come to understand what something is saying, not just by banging our heads against the walls, but by actually just being creative, trying to you know take a something, flip it upside down, look at it again. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, yeah. I, I hope that I, I hope that that's uh, encouraging. I, I don't know, but I I certainly hope so. Oh, most definitely. That was very encouraging. It um, the whole as you were talking, the more it reminded me of. Plato's dialogues over and over again. Um, just the the way that he always entered in through humility, even though any of us who study his dialogues would consider Socrates a master, he never acted like 
walking into the truth with the people he was asking questions of. He wanted truth to win. He wanted to know the truth. And so it sounds like the way to be a good math teacher is to be a good math student, <laughs> based on what you're saying. And being willing, you know, um, and this idea of humility, I mean, that's the same in our literature and writing classes, is that, like you said, that that's when real learning can happen when we acknowledge that we don't know something because as long as we think we have it figured out <laughs> we're not really open to new ideas um, so I love that that's very very encouraging um, and that just it's okay we have and we can wrestle through it together and arrive at the truth at hand together so I appreciate that thank you so so what other thoughts, um, is there anything else that you wanted to ask or talk about, um, about math and the liberal arts? I think we've touched on most of, um, most everything. Um, yeah, the, the, there was one, one, one question I had. Um, this is something which, which, which I've thought some about, and I think that we've already answered this question uh, perhaps to a great degree, but maybe, maybe we could just revisit it for a second because I think this is mm -hmm. something which, um, it's kind of a plague uh, in our culture of mm -hmm. defending the liberal arts in all the wrong ways um, okay. and just defending education in all the wrong ways. And I remember, um, uh, and it, this was no fault of, of my parents. I think it was just sort of the uh, pervasive culture where I got, mm -hmm. I got this idea. And it's the idea that, you know, the only reason you go to school is so that you can go to college and the only reason you go to college is so that you can get a good job, uh, so that you can live in a nicer neighborhood, so you can afford uh, to send your kids to a better college and retire on an island or something, right? <laughs> Which is just this bleak picture of what it means to exist. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess, so nestled in that framework that we tend to have as a culture is this idea that the mathematics is really something which should be pursued just because it's useful in sciences, it's useful in technology. Uh, but I don't think that as classical Christian educators, we should be mm -hmm. teaching something really because it's, it's useful, or at least something this foundational, I think, we shouldn't, def we shouldn't have to defend uh, based on its usefulness for right. something like science, technology, uh, things which I right. think we ought to consider more peripheral. Um, mm -hmm. they're not really dealing with... Kind of icing on the cake. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I was just wondering, did you, do you have any, any, any insights perhaps on how we can, we can do a better job defending, uh, defending the mathematical arts? Mm -hmm. Well, that's an interesting question. I definitely want to think more about it, my initial reaction would just be that um, that we ourselves wrestle through it in a way that's different from a utilitarian view. I think a lot of times we we justify the study of math, or we talk about the purpose of the study of mathematics just because um, in a utilitarian way is because that's how we think about it. We're not used to even considering the idea that there is there is a, a virtue that can be arrived at by studying mathematics. That's foreign to our culture. I mean, I can't tell you how many hours I spent studying the language arts um, of the first three, three liberal arts before I actually published the article because I was just, I mean, I was planning on already having this series done. Like, I was, I was supposed to have it done, completely finished, and I have been, I think, I'm going into my third month. I thought, thought it was going to be done in a month, and I'm in my third month because every time I think, not satisfied, because I, you just get that sense that there's a principle at hand that you're missing. You're just not getting something, mm -hmm. and um, and I think that we need to be aware of that and be willing to admit that there's something about the way the ancients and the medievals looked at education and looked at the liberal arts that we just can't comprehend because of the culture we live in. And we need to be brave enough to say that out loud, um, say that in writing, and then and then and seek it out. Um, by, by being willing to admit that out loud, um, some of the things that I began to discover about the liberal art of grammar 
just blew my mind to make sense. Um, and so I, th I think that's the first step, that we, we just admit that there, there's a different way of viewing reality. And, and we're kind of detached from that um, because, of, because of our culture. Um, and r rightly so. There's no, it's not any dogging on any one person or the other. It's, it's just our, our culture. And so being aware of that, um, I, I think that would be the first thing. Yeah. Um, I, I, what do you I, think? I, I think that that's, that's really helpful. And one thing you said um, actually made me realize something just now, because you said that uh, we seem to be almost, uh, how did you say it? I think you said something about how we're just conditioned as a culture to think this way. And you said how our teaching approach is so different in the classical tradition. And I thought, you know, I, and, and, I thought this is this is immediately obvious when when we look at how textbooks are 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 structured, especially math textbooks, mm -hmm. um, because they're all structured around learn the material so that you can do X, Y, and Z. Um, mm -hmm. And it's never learn the material so you can think about how amazing this principle is. It's never learn the material and let's step back and think about just how bizarre it is that this is, is actually true. Um, or let's step back and just see how beautiful this concept is. It's all about memorize this, move on, memorize something else, uh, because you're going to need to know it for these applications. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it is a complete paradigm shift. Um, right. And... Uh, and I had just ne it just never occurred to me that the textbooks that we tend to use uh, mm -hmm. emphasize the same kind of utilitarian uh, uh, method, I guess, or uh, ideology. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's why C.S. Lewis's book, Abolition of Man, is so vital for um, the renewal of this tradition uh, because he asks the hard questions and he has that hard conversation um, that makes us look at all of our materials and at mm. just this idea of in embodiment, like what is embodied and how we teach, just the structure of not even talking, believe in this transcendent reality, then everything we do embodies something and communicates something about reality and what are we communicating um, and and the purpose of education too I think I mean just looking back at that and it goes back to how the ancients viewed reality it was a different way they just looked at everything differently the purpose of education was just completely different it was never to master nature it was to master oneself to be changed internally I, I loved this story this was so I think it was was in Sister Miriam Jose's book, uh, The Trivium, and she, she was, it was, I can't, I have to look at what part, talking about um, when would engage in debate, and, um, and they would, they would be going back and forth with their, their rhetorical purposes, and, um, and having a discussion, and, and saying this, and saying that, and then in the end, whoever then, couldn't say anything else, and in, in our current culture, would, we would have said that person lost. Actually, in the ancient time, they would have said that person won, because they were the one they were in truth. And so the, the greatest good in life to the ancients was to discover new truth. And so they were, they were engaging in rhetoric, so they could learn truth. They wanted to learn something new. They wanted a clearer view of reality. They wanted to be transformed, and they realized their own perspectives were standing in the way of that. That's what the liberal arts are all about, is giving the mind, um, opening these seven organs so, so we can view reality more accurately. And and so the... the the mathematical arts are a part of that. They're four of the seven liberal arts, and, and and they can each cultivate, each of those cultivates an organ in us that allows us to view reality more accurately and therefore discover truth more precisely and then be changed and uh, become more fully alive. And that's what it was the ancient, to be more fully alive, to be fully alive. Um, so...
kind of exciting to think about. <laughs> yeah, that 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 is very exciting. You know, and and it reminds me of um, it reminds me of uh, this uh, this idea that 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 we that we encounter. I think um, when we study art, it's the idea that. Um, in one sense, it is valid to judge art. We have to do that. But in, in another sense, the art is also judging us. Mm. Uh, because when we approach a, a great work of art, this is, I think, only, really only true of, of, of truly great pieces of art, but these great works of art, in one sense, judge us as the observers because they challenge us to reevaluate um, things that we hold dear, we, uh, cause us to, or they, or they, they, they should anyway, cause us to um, reevaluate ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and it's this idea of transformation, being transformed by the material rather than taking it and using it like a tool. And I think this is, this is, this, mm -hmm. this is, is really key. And it goes back, I think, to what we were saying about mathematics, just the difference that it makes. And you know, when you approach mathematics, not so that you can take it and use it for something, which is a perfectly valid application of it. Um, mm -hmm. I think that that's that's a good way of, of of redeeming mathematics. But we have to also, uh, I think, as you've said, approach it with with the idea that in studying mathematics, we are being transformed. The mathematics yeah. is transforming us. It's transforming the way that we process the world, the way that we think, the clarity with which we're able to think. Um, yeah. Our our attunedness to the beauty that God has put into in, into the universe, um, hmm. so it really should be a transformative experience. Yeah, so uh, to for us um, beyond merely just getting new tools in our tool belt. Uh, yeah, I think that that's a a a. a just a beautiful thought. It's and it's not one that we that we find very frequently. Right. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time here today, and I don't want to keep you too long, but I actually think this is a perfect way to end. Um, these are some beautiful thoughts, and I, and I hope everyone continues to think about them and join the conversation. Um, hop on the comments. or the, It's definitely being recovered. We're all in this together. And um, Daniel, thank you again for all your time. I really appreciate your um, answering questions, asking questions, and, and being available today. Sure. Well, well, thanks so much for having me. I have thoroughly uh, enjoyed this, and and um, and I really appreciate that. Uh, that even in our conversation, I I feel like I've gained new insights, um, uh, which is really I think what all this is about, all this sharing. So uh, so thank you. This has been great. My pleasure. Same here. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. You too, thanks.